Welcome to Journey Church. We are so glad that you are joining us online or in person, and we can't wait to see what God is going to do today in the middle of our service. In just a few minutes, service will begin and will last a little over an hour. If you're new here at Journey Church, we would love to get connected with you. We have a digital connect card that you can fill out by scanning the QR code in the seat pocket in front of you if you're joining us in person, or if you're online, you can click the link in the comments below. Here at Journey Church, we are passionate about people experiencing life transformation through Jesus. And we want everyone to have the opportunity to come to church. Our weekend services are at 9 and 11 on Sundays with an additional Spanish service at 6 p.m. We ask that you help us keep service as distraction-free as possible. So here are just a few ways that you can help us do that. If you must leave during the service, we ask that you sit in the back when you return. Also, please make sure to silence your cell phone as to not disturb those around you. If your child becomes fussy, we welcome you to take advantage of our children's ministry taking place next door in the student center, or you can make yourself comfortable in our lobby. Thank you so much for helping to create a distraction-free environment. Well, lastly, we don't want you to forget to be a part of our online community, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week. So be sure to follow us on social media so that you can stay up to date on all things happening right here at Journey. We encourage you to grab your Bible, grab a notebook, sing out loud and worship with us, and let us know how we can be praying with you. Service will begin shortly. Good morning, Journey family. If you want to stand with us together, we are going to worship together. Thank you for joining us online. Let's put our hands together this morning. This is the day that the Lord our God has made. Hearts open wide as your freedom comes to reign. We come alive as we live the name of Jesus higher, higher. This is the roar that will silence every fear. Our shackles fall as you shake the atmosphere. We come alive as we live the name of Jesus higher, higher. You are the one.
God. Amen. I don't know about you, but I do not want to hold back from God's presence this morning. I want to press in. I want to dive in. And I want to be embraced by His presence. Amen. If you want to just turn to your neighbor next to you this morning and say good morning. And then you can have a seat. What's up, Journey fam? We are so excited that you are joining us online and in person. It's not an accident that you're here today, and we believe that this will be a defining moment for you. Whatever you're going through, get your hopes up because God is in a good mood. In just a few moments, we are going to sing a few more songs of worship. But before we do, we want to give you the chance to worship through your giving. If you're here with us in the room, you can give by scanning the QR code in the seat pocket in front of you or by using the black offering boxes located at the back of the worship center. And if you're joining at our online campus, you can give online or on our Journey Church app. If you're looking for ways to get connected, check out the events tab online where you can stay up to date on all things happening here at Journey Church. If you're here in person, we ask that you help us keep service as distraction free as possible. Don't forget to silence your cell phone. And if your child becomes fussy, don't hesitate to take advantage of our nursery. That's it for this week's church news. Whether you're joining us online or in person, get ready to experience God's presence in a personal and life changing way. Oh, good grief. Hey, she's a good looking girl though, that's for sure. Uh, it's my daughter, if some of you are wondering. I'm not being a weird creeper. Uh, but it is good to see you today. Welcome to Journey Church. We are glad you're with us today. And I just believe you're gonna be impacted, uh, not by a message or worship, but by Jesus Christ. He's in this room. His spirit is with us. So welcome this morning. Make yourself at home. If you're a guest with us, love to have you. Uh, let us know if we can join with you in this journey, serving the Lord. you have any questions, uh, maybe about Journey Church or your relationship with Christ, we'd love to be a part of that journey with you. If you grab your phone and put the camera over the QR code in front of you, there should be a QR code in the seat in front of you. It has everything going on on our app, our Journey Church. You can get a Bible app there, uh, anything. If you wanna just put your camera there or go to our website, let us know uh, that you're with us today at www.thejourneylife.org and uh, fill out a connection card. We'd love to just be a part uh, of this journey with you. We have some guests with us. If you're home as well, joining us for the first time, we just want you to know we're glad you're with us to our online community and uh, hearing God do some great things. Can we welcome our online community and our guests that are with us today? Make yourself at home today. One thing I want to make mention of uh, that's happening on the horizon. Youth convention is a couple weeks away. If you have a teenager, uh, Lord knows they could use some help and Lord knows you could use a weekend free. Well, I want you to go to our website, talk to Pastor Tell Destiny. Uh, youth convention is one of those events that, that I believe can impact your kid's life and change their life. And uh, we've seen it work. Camp and convention, we've seen that just challenge so many young people. Love to have you sign up for that. I know some of you say, well, Pastor, it's homecoming weekend. Uh, whatever, they'll have another homecoming. Maybe they won't. I don't know, COVID didn't allow it. But we want them to go to convention. Let them be a part of that. It's gonna be an incredible weekend. And I uh, just believe God to change their life. So sign up for that. And uh, they will not, I promise you, they will not be disappointed with that. Uh, one thing we'd like to do this morning that um, uh, God put in my heart as a pastor and our leadership team and our board uh, that I wanna report to you a couple things. I wanna say, first of all, thank you for your faithfulness as a church. You are an incredible church with your resource, with your energy, with your giving. Uh, this is an amazing church, and I don't know if you know that. Just look around, you see some amazing people, but God has blessed Journey Church with incredible generosity, and uh, I, I've learned years ago that you can't outgive God. And one of the things that's crazy is I, I'm not good at asking for money. I'm the worst at asking for money. Uh, and it's probably because I've asked my wife for 25 years and I get none. And so I just don't do well uh, asking for money. And, and uh, I learned this years ago that, that if you have an issue with money, it's usually not a financial issue. It's usually a heart condition. And so as a pastor, I learned years ago that I can try to beg for something. But if your heart's not changed, it ain't going to change the way you do giving. 
And so this church has an incredible heart, an incredible generous heart. And uh, about six months ago, I felt like God put in my heart to do something. Many of you know every Easter, we give our entire Easter offering away to local mission, local ministry. And some of you, I don't know if you like that or not. I love being able to write a check and say, we wanna bless House of Ruth and what you do to this community because we believe in life. We wanna bless uh, different pantries. And so we do that at Easter, and I felt like God said this, and some of you may say, well, pastor, what's the why in this? I, I, I love how God said in the Old Testament, he said, test me in one thing. How many of you know as a parent, you don't like your kids testing you? <laughs> but Father said, test me in one thing. Test me in your giving that you can give, and I won't prove my faithfulness in responding to your giving. I'm paraphrasing, but, but the Bible says, don't rob God, but test me in that. So I felt like as a pastor, God was saying, we've got a building coming. You're going to have a uh, cost to a building, and I just want to say this. I believe that if we live like we are believing for miracles next door, God's going to do that. And so I felt like God put in my heart in prayer that, that we're going to do something every quarter now as a church, and you may not like it, but what you will hear in giving, we want to give a legacy offering every quarter. So we instituted as a board, and here's what a legacy offering is. A legacy offering is sowing into the legacy of the kingdom of God with church planting, with missions, with future. It's not something that goes to salaries, utilities, nothing in-house. We want to give that all away. And I felt like God put in my heart that we're going to take four offerings every year, and we're going to give it away. Easter's one of them, and we're going to do it quarterly. And you may say, well, pastor, how in the world do you do that? Well, first of all, know as a church, we believe in the 90-20 principle. It's a tithing principle. Yes. And as a church, if we expect people biblically to give of a tithe, we're going to live on 90% and at least give 10% away. This church over the last seven years has given over 20% away to mission, to church planting, and it is incredible. But last month in August, actually two months ago, many of you remember uh, that we ended up giving an offering. This was not kind of the way we wanted to do it, but we gave an offering to ICA. And uh, ICA is the International Church in Bangkok, Pastor Dana and Bridget our pastors there, they had a massive flood. It, it destroyed their whole facility, their flooring, their drywall, all of that. And so we received an offering and we gave it to IC. I wanna to report to you and you say, Pastor, what took so long? Because um, we're trying to learn as we go. We gave uh, over $7,800 uh, in that one offering, and we sent it all to ICA. In a moment, you're going to watch a video of what your monies went toward and the, the miraculous, and it was a massive impact. Pastor Dana and Bridget sent us a video, and uh, I want to say per personally, thank you for giving to that. Uh, over the next year, we have some projects we're going to give toward that I feel like God's putting in our heart, and, I, and I'll just say this to you. You may say, well, that's not the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. I want to give and love giving, and I want to give it away. We're stewards of what God's given us. But our first one was in August, and uh, we gave to ICA, 7,800 and change uh, to ICA, and it was incredible what you did. So thank you for your giving. Thank you for your generosity, and uh, we will keep you posted as it moves forward, and we will do better at reporting that. But I want to say thank you. Why don't you give your guys a, a big hand for that uh, offering, that generosity? Amen. Pastor Dana and Bridget sewed here for years, and, and I spoke to him this last week. He was just humbled by your generosity. So I'd like for Nicole just to share a couple things happening with ICA as well, and uh, then we'll watch this video and uh, let God just do great things in our service. Amen. I don't know if any of you know, well, I know some of you know, but I actually had the privilege of serving at ICA last year um, and with, with Pastor Dina and Bridget. And I worked in several ministries with them, not only worship, but I also was a part of a ministry called Sealed. And Sealed is a ministry that works with men, women, and children and getting them off of the streets. So human sex trafficking, uh, human trafficking. And it is a very real thing I have seen it with my own eyes. I have walked the streets and I've had conversations with, with men, with women. Um, I've been to cities where children are trafficked, young children. I mean, they're sometimes seven, eight years old um, and they start to get prepped for that kind of a job that they would call it by their own parents because their parents, they're so impoverished, they have to sell their children. And I'm not saying this to um, make anyone feel sad or overwhelmed, but I want to put that in your heart because it is something that not just happens in Thailand and in, in the city of Bangkok and around Thailand, but it also happens here in our very United States. Um, there is a story that Bridget tells. There was a young woman who was actually trafficked from down in the valley 
um, and she was able to escape, um, long story short. And so it is something that is very prevalent. And I was able and honored to be able to serve with, with Bridget um, while I was over there. And we started preparing for something called the World Sealed Conference. Now, this was supposed to be something that was supposed to be live. Actually, James, my husband, and I, we were going to go to Thailand uh, this October. And I was going to lead worship over there. But because of COVID, we weren't able to go. So what they had to do is they're doing it virtually. So it's going to be the virtual World Sealed Conference. This is going to be for ladies. Um, it's going to be October 16th, which is here in a couple weeks. And it's from 9 to 4. And it's $20. And that $20 goes towards your lunch. And it also is a donation towards sealed um, to break the trafficking, to break uh, that stronghold. And let me tell you, COVID, it's been horrible, but at the same time, it has been a blessing in the red light districts because it has shut things down. And so this conference is going to be incredible. I want to encourage you ladies to come to be a part. Um, there's going to be world-renowned speakers that are part of um, very, very big anti-trafficking groups. There's going to be worship. Actually, our team uh, gets to lead the first half of it, which was a huge honor. Um, and there's also going to be a fashion show at the end um, by some major designers. And so it's going to be a really neat but new conference. We're obviously you know, kind of exploring because we've never done a virtual one before because um, it can't be live. So I want to encourage you ladies to go ahead and join. And then just to know that ICA is making a difference. Um, I'm just honored to be able to serve. I want to say thank you to this church, to this body. You guys supported me so faithfully. <laughs> I could not have been in Thailand and doing what I was doing without this church. And so I want to say thank you to those that are watching online as well. Thank you for, for getting missionaries overseas, um, for blessing ICA. Uh, you guys, amazing church. I honestly can't even thank you enough. Um, I haven't even had the opportunity to, to thank everybody um, for helping me to get overseas because it was an honor and a blessing and I can't say thank you enough. So we are going to watch a quick video um, from Pastor Dean and Bridget and the staff at ICA. Hello Journey Church, greetings from Bangkok, Thailand. Bridget and I just want to say thank you to all of you at the church who have given sacrificially. We want to thank Pastor Jeremy and Rachel and the board as well. It's been so significant what you have done to help us through some of the crisis we've been in in the last couple of months, especially with the COVID lockdown and the flooding of the church. But your generosity has been a difference maker. We are so excited. We just opened our doors again and we're meeting live only with the 25 people at a time, but we're very excited to get back to normal. But thank you so much for all that you have done for us and the ministries here and our outreaches. We can't fully express our gratitude to you. We are so grateful, we're thankful, and we can't wait for you to see the before and after pictures of this flood. It would not have been possible without your generosity, your love, and your prayers. We love you so much, Journey Church, and an entire church and staff love you as well. Thank you, we can't wait for you to send a team here to Bangkok, yes. Thailand, so that we can really minister together someday. We love you. God bless you. Journey Church. Uh, I am Duilio. She's my wife, Marcia. We are missionary from Argentina. Uh, we are thankful for supporting uh, uh, ICA Bangkok here in Thailand. We are so thankful for your generosity and the way that you show that you love our church here in Bangkok. We work uh, with the outreach, uh, serving the homeless and the people in need. And actually, we are so, so happy to partner with you and through your generosity and all the seeds that you send to us. So we are, you are always in our hearts and our prayers. Hello Journey Church. I am Tony. This is my wife Pinky. We are missionaries from Pakistan. We serve with ICA Bangkok. We lead a language center. 
We also shepherd a group of our Pakistani asylum seekers and refugees living in Bangkok. We are truly thankful uh, for your support and for your love for our ministries and church. We pray that God will bless you even more and will use you in a mighty way to enhance his kingdom, especially here in Bangkok. You are always in our hearts and in our prayers. Thanks again. We love you. God bless. Hello, Journey Church. I'm Mehdi. This is Sara, my wife. We are Iranian pastor at ICA. Uh, I want to say thank you so much for your help, for your support, for your generosity. God bless you. And I want to say thank you as well. God bless you richly. Thank you. Hello, I'm Pastor Michael from the Philippines and I'm one of the pastoral staff here in ICA. I am uh, in charge of our small group ministry which is called Connect Group as well as I help with the Compassion Ministry under the Pantry uh, Ministry. We would like to thank Journey Church for their generous donations for our building restoration and we pray that the Lord will bless you more than what you have given. Thank you very much and God bless you. Hello, Jenny Church. My name is Betty. I'm from Zimbabwe. I am the youth interim leader here at ICA Church. Thank you so much for your kindness and generosity. May God bless you. Hello, Journey Church. My name is Doline from Cameroon. I am the college ministry pastor and the young adult pastor here at ICA Bangkok. I just want to thank you so much for your generosity and your support to ICA Bangkok and to our different ministries. God bless you. Sawadika. Hello, brothers and sisters from Journey Church. I'm Art. I'm from Thailand. I serve the Lord here at ICA Bangkok Church as a Thai interpreter and the staff of the lead team. Thank you for being a part of the body of Christ to show that God is so faithful. God bless you. Amen. Amen. If you want to go ahead and stand to your feet, we are going to worship together this morning. Before we start, I just wanted to say that God is on the throne and that He is victorious. Even in those moments of our life where we do not feel it, where we feel overwhelmed, we feel confused, that His presence is still here and that His victory is real. So Father God, we come into your courts this morning, God, with praise on our lips. Father, we thank you for the incredible things that you're not just doing in this body, but God, that you're doing around the world. God, you are good and you are on the throne. And Lord, you are victorious. And so, Father God, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory as we worship you this morning. In your name we pray, Father God.
for just a moment as we just head towards a moment of communion hopefully on your way in this morning you got one of these little cups that has the little wafer in the top and the juice in the bottom if you're at home maybe you can quickly go get something as we just kind of get ready for that uh, if you don't have juice cracker just bread water whatever you have will work at home but we invite you to join us and be a part of this moment that is so important for us when we come together as the body of Christ, as the family, and we sit at the table together, because that's really what this is. I know we don't have a table, but we're at the table as we just share in, in communion and fellowship, and not only with one another, but with the Lord. This last week, Cindy and I had the privilege of hosting our Journey College students at our house for breakfast on Wednesday, and it was just interesting as we sat around the table to just listen to them talk there's something about getting around a table stories just happen and it you know it's it's interesting what happens in that moment we heard some I learned some things <laughs> it was just it was it was nice to just be quiet and listen to the stories there were there was confession that happened <laughs> I mean they confessed on the behalf of someone else but that's okay there was there was confession, there was memories, there were stories that happened, just, and laughter and fun, and it, it was awesome, enjoyed that so much, and, and when we come together at table this morning, um, it, there is a story, and, and I just want to share with you, I'm going to take maybe a different little, little side trail that we don't talk about often in communion, but, but when we come to the table, there are stories, and, and here's where I feel is the potential threat to the effectiveness of Christianity today. I feel like there are times that we think that it's some outer force 
Like it's, it's the political realm is the great threat to Christianity. I don't think that's true. I, I don't think Satan is the great threat, threat to Christianity, to our effectiveness. It's not, it's not a virus that's the greatest threat to our effectiveness as, as believers. I think the greatest threat to our Christianity and our effectiveness is that we make ourselves the center of the story. Because we're not the center of the story. Even in your salvation story, you're not the center of the story. It's Jesus. He rose, he reigns, he died on the cross for you and for I. He is the center of our story. And I think the risk is when we start making us the center because what happens, whatever is at the center of your story is what you worship. Think about that for a minute. What is the center of your story? What, what does your life revolve around? Is it sports? Is it food? Is it work? What is it that we, and, and I just say this as, as one at the table with you today, it is so easy to let our life become about something other than Jesus Christ. To let my life become about my, my worry about finances or the struggle that I'm going through or my health or, or other people. And we can make those things the center and it's so easy. So when we come to communion, I think it's an, an important opportunity for us to recalibrate or recenter our lives around that which it should be centered. Yeah. Acts chapter 17, verse 28, a verse that we probably have never read in the context of communion says, in him we live and we move and we exist. It's not in me. It's not in what I bring to the table. It's what he has brought to the table. And the story, your story becomes powerful when he becomes the center of that story. When you're the center of the story, it's usually a story of defeat and failure and mistakes and regrets. But when he's the center of the story, everything changes. And I just want us to take a moment this morning. We're not gonna, we're not gonna linger, we're not gonna take a lot of time, but it's hard to sing he reigns, hallelujah, he reigns, if I'm reigning. Yeah. It's hard to say that he's Lord if I'm Lord over my life. And I want us to take a minute, because communion is an amazing moment, and scripture tells us when we come to this moment, we're to remember. It's a reminder to remember what Christ has done for us, what he did on the cross, what he did as he rose from the grave, but what he's doing in our lives today, remember what God has done in your life. Remember that story. Don't remember your mistakes. Remember how he helped you overcome your mistake. Remember that he is the center of the story. But it's also a time for us to repent. There's a word not used in church near enough. A time for us to come and to repent and say, not some... I'm not saying, hinting that we have some deep, dark, hidden sin that we've, maybe, but it's so easy just over the week to let something else become the center of my story. To let an event, to whatever it is, that we just let it rise up and that becomes the center and it's a moment for us today to just come and say, no, that's not the center of my story. My worry, my concern, my sickness, my job, my finances, the politicians, that disease, that is not the center of my story. Jesus is the center of my story. And if he's at the center of the story, there's victory. We overcome and we can be victorious. And so we repent of those things that we've let creep in to become the center and we recalibrate, we recenter on him. And we say again today that Jesus, you are the center of my story. Because my story without you is disaster. But my story with you is victory. So I'm going to ask you to do something as you take this cup and you peel back and take that, that wafer from the top. We're going to pray this morning, yes, in an attitude of gratitude, thanking God for what he's done and what Jesus did on the cross. But I want us to just pray a prayer of submission as well. To say, God, that thing that I've let become the center, I, I choose today to let that, that hold it has on me be broken. And may I be broken the way that Jesus was broken. Because communion is, yes, a time of fellowship, and remember, but it's a, it's a call back to repentance. It's a call to live a broken life. And I'm going to invite you to do that with me. Would you just take that bread in your hand? Father, today, before we take this, we come to you and we remember what your son did on the cross. I thank you, Jesus, that you were broken for my brokenness. 
that you took my sin, you took my mistakes, you took my story and you changed it and you rewrote it by your mercy and by your grace. And so in return today, I choose to put away all those things that seem to pile up in my life and become the center of it. And I I choose today to break the hold they have on me. And I choose today to be surrendered and broken before you as you were broken for me. May my life be broken before you. Break the hold that this life has on us in this moment. Even if it's just over this last week, the things that we let creep in, God, we choose today to let let those things be laid aside and we recalibrate and we make you the center and we choose today to do what many followers would not do in your day. That when you said, unless you eat my bread and eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can have no part. We choose today to have a part by choosing brokenness and surrender before you. And would you come and forgive us? Let the grace of God overwhelm us in this moment. And may we be reminded that you are the center of all things. And in you, we live, we move, we have our existence. We thank you for it today. And we choose brokenness today in your name. Amen. Would you take that bread together and just an attitude of just surrender and brokenness. God, we give it to you. We give it to you, Lord. We surrender to your Lordship. Lord, we take this this cup and this juice that's symbolic of the blood that was shed that forgives our sins. And so we just follow that brokenness, that repentance. God, forgive us for making us the center of the story. And we follow it with this symbol of the shed blood that gives us victory, that covers that mistake that forgives that sin and you wash us and you cleanse us and cause us to walk in victory. Lord, that verse, when I, when I read it, when I, when I quote it in you, we live and move and have our being. It's not a, a, a defeated story. It's a victorious story that I have freedom in you, freedom to live my life in you today because of what you did. And I choose today to walk in your victory, not in my strength, but in your strength. I choose today to walk in your victory over my failure. And I thank you for your grace. And we invite you in today to be the Lord and to be victorious in our lives. You reign. You're the center of our story. And we thank you for that reminder. Would you take that cup together? Now, would you just take a few seconds? Maybe there's a need to just name that thing that you're setting aside. Or even just to recalibrate and recenter today. Say, God, help me this week. Just pray this with me. God, help me this week to ensure that you're the center of everything that happens. I don't want to live and move and exist in in me and my story and my weakness. I want to move and live and exist in your strength and your grace and your empowerment and your love and your patience and your kindness. I lean on it and I trust in it. God, may your victory wash victory wash over us this week. May we not walk in defeat because we make mistakes, but may we walk in victory because you've forgiven and you walk in forgiveness day in and day out. And we declare again that you are Lord. You are victorious. You reign over our life. You are the center. Would you stand with me? And as we just sing that chorus again, can we make it our declaration today that God, you reign. You reign in my life. You reign in my fears. You reign in my finances, in my home, in my career, in every aspect of my life and my health. God, you reign and you are victorious. Can we just declare that together today before we turn to the word and let it change our lives? Nicole, if you lead us. Across this place, 
to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords we say Hallelujah. Lord, in adoration we exalt you and our God. One more time we sing Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Oh, there's nothing impossible with you. Hallelujah. Your great God. Your name is greatly to be praised. Hallelujah, oh, for our God reigns. Amen. If you believe that your God reigns over any infirmity, disease, over your past, over your shame, how many of you know we have a God that's mighty? Amen. If you believe that, can you give God, listen, hang on, hang on, hang on. Give God applause that is worthy of who he is, not something that a Phoenix Suns game is worthy of. Or I saw Minnesota Viking jersey is worthy of. Kirk Cousins, not that great. But I want to give God a round of applause. I challenge you at home. Let's just praise in the midst of what we're going through that he's great and greatly to be praised. Come on. Let's give him praise. Amen. We serve a great God. Amen. Amen. Would you turn to somebody next to you and say, God is victorious? Just declare that and be seated this morning if you can. Amen. Praise God. I don't know why. I just kind of saw like a spiritual wave. I thought, I don't know why. I was really weird. We're not going to do that. That's not what we're going to do. Anyway, it is good to see you today. Great to be in the house of God. If you have your Bible, would you turn with me this morning to the book of Galatians? Uh, the book of Galatians. We're going to start uh, a new series today. I wish I could tell you I knew how long it's going to be. I don't. Uh, but I feel like we need to just dive into a book that uh, that kind of just this season. How many of you know the Word of God sometimes just settles some things in us? And I feel like we just need to put kind of a, a parenthesis in this season in the book of Galatians. I'll be honest, I've never preached out of Galatians uh, in terms of a series. I love the book of Galatians and the epistle that, that Paul wrote. Uh, to the early church in the region of Galatia, and uh, it wasn't just a city, it was a region, and we're going to look to this scripture, and uh, I love this about Galatians, and here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about grace under fire. Grace under fire. The book of Galatians was written, and many theologians, historians, different ones would say a couple things, just a brief history so you know what we're jumping into, and we'll refer to some of this each week briefly. But here's the deal with, with Galatians. Many say that Galatians is the manifesto of freedom. It's the book of the Bible. Martin Luther actually put it this way with Galatians. He said these words. He goes, this is my little book. Many of you remember Martin Luther King Jr. who put the theses on the door of the, the Catholic Church and said, I, I believe grace is is this. I believe the church is saying opposite of what grace is. And many of you remember the Reformation or you've studied or you've heard about the spiritual Reformation that happened with Martin Luther King and uh, with, uh, uh, with Bunyan and different ones that were uh, preachers of that day. Here was the gospel of the Reformation. And we're going to talk about it for a few moments. It's this, that we are saved by, through, and that not of what? All right. We are saved by, through and not what? Of works or that of ourselves. That was the pervasive, the influential gospel of the entire Reformation. Now, I got to tell you, it was transformational in the church to that day. It did not make sense with the dogma and the doctrine of that day. And some would say, well, Pastor, why are we talking about it today? Because I believe that the same grace that was under fire during the Reformation is under fire today. And I believe it's coming from two places. In Galatians chapter 1, we'll begin reading in a moment where I think it's coming from. But there are two places, if you want to jot this down, as Martin Luther loved this book, as it's the manifesto of freedom, there's all of these little things that are nuggets about Galatians we could talk about. But I believe that it's something powerful. And if we can go backwards to move forward, in the book of Habakkuk, 
I'm not going to have you turn there, but you can research it. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, is a verse that is in three New Testament books. It's this verse, that the righteous or the just will live by faith. Say that with me. Say the just will live by faith. Here we go. The just will live by faith. Listen to what Habakkuk said, and yet there are three books of the New Testament that say that same verse, quoted in three different books. The first book is the book of Romans. How many of you know what the book of Romans is about? Say grace. It's about grace, but here's the ultimate theme of the book of Romans. It's talking about how Paul begins to communicate to the early church what it means to be just. That I am righteous, not of myself, but I am just or justified through the work of the cross and what Jesus did on the work of the cross. So Romans talks about the just will live by faith. It takes that portion of the just. Galatians also says the just will live by faith. And Galatians talks about the portion of the body of Christ or the New Testament church or the just. And it begins to talk about how we shall live. Look at your neighbor and say, are you alive? Come on, just say it. How many of you have ever questioned? Come on, let's confess for a moment. How many of you have ever questioned if you are living appropriately to what the word of God says? Has anyone ever done that before? How many of you have ever felt like you're not good enough according to the word of God? Just be honest, confession's good for the soul, not your reputation, but there's a lot of us that have sorry reputations. We just all raised our, a bunch of us raised our hands. We're like, Pastor, that's true. A bunch of us raised our hands online. So Romans talks about what it means to be just. Paul talks about in Galatians about how we're to live in that grace. And then Hebrews is the third book of the New Testament that says the just will live by faith. And I think it talks about very clearly throughout Hebrews about faith and how that's operational. We're going to take that middle portion of Habakkuk 2.4 and we're going to talk about how we live in the kingdom of God. I got to say this in love and here's why I think grace is under fire. I think grace is under fire in the culture we live because of the way that we live. First way grace is under fire is this. There is what is called cheap grace. Say cheap grace. It's I'm going to do whatever I want, whatever feels good, do it. It's under the blood of Christ. I'm okay, and I'm just going to live the way I want to live, and we have cheapened grace by just whatever feels good, do it. That should have had a resounding amen but it's not good for many of us because here's what many of us have done and in the church, we have swung to one side of the pendulum and said, you know what, I'm gonna do whatever I want. It's under the blood of Christ, it's under grace and I am forgiven. And we are, but we've cheapened grace. Because if grace is really at work in you, why would you live for yourself? Pastor Jerry nailed it. I'm centering me, and I'm gonna do whatever feels good, and it's the root of hell and Satan, where he said, I'm just gonna do what pleases me, and we call it grace. The second way that we see grace under fire today, and Paul was speaking to this some 2,000 years ago, is not only cheap grace, but we have twisted grace. And we have what's called twisted grace where we have certain people talking to you from religious segments, from from, uh, uh, different backgrounds, from different dogma, different theology. And here's how we have twisted grace that we've put out these things like if you do enough, then you'll receive it. If you're good enough, then you'll receive it. And we have attached grace to this thing called the law and they aren't attached in context of how we live. And so we have many believers today that don't feel worthy enough because they've broken the law. Why do we have the law, by the way, the Old Testament, the law of the Scripture? Why do we have that? We have that because that shows us where we fall short in our living, but that doesn't redeem us to live the way we're called to live. And see, here's why we need grace. Grace comes in, and grace changes me to be more like Jesus, to where the law isn't binding me, but the Spirit of God is giving me life, and I can now live under grace that only comes from Christ. I'll never be good enough on my best day to attain to God's holiness. I need grace. But we have twisted grace that is this idea of I attach what I receive in grace to what I do in actions, and that's not biblical either. So we're going to try to find truth in grace today, if that's all right with you. I don't know if you want it, but I want it this morning. Galatians chapter 1, we're going to have a great day, and I hope it encourages you. Galatians chapter 1, if you're there, say, I got it. Verse 1, here we go. The Bible says, and the letter is from Paul, an apostle, which, by the way, this is one of the few uh, letters from Paul that the theologians believe he actually wrote out with his own hand. Many believe that there were others that he wrote uh, by verbing and wordage, and they wrote it out, but Galatians, he wrote with his own 
own hand. I, Paul, an apostle, was appointed, was not appointed by any group or people uh, or any human authority, but I was appointed by Jesus Christ himself, by God the Father who raised Jesus from the dead. How many of you know if God appoints you, it's good enough to listen to, amen? And I love this. Paul is real clearly given his authority to what he's gonna talk to. He's given the backdrop of I know what I'm talking about because God's the one who told me to talk about it. It isn't what I learned as a Pharisee. And then verse two says this, all brothers and sisters join me in sending this letter to the churches of Galatia. May God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, give you what? Grace and peace. I want you to consider this real quickly. When you look throughout the New Testament, that is the succession of those two words almost every time. Grace first, peace later. Think about it just for a moment. Could you be lacking peace because you don't understand grace? Many in the church today lack peace and we are scared that we're gonna go to hell because we don't understand grace. Many of us lack peace in our living because we're not under the grace of God. Isn't it crazy? There are some people that can be in the most horrifying of situations and still have a sustaining peace. It's because they understand grace. My grandma and I were talking the other day and, and, uh, and, and there's interesting, she's getting into certain parts of scripture and she's probably watching today, but uh, we were, we've been talking about um, a lot of end times things and what the Bible says and, and all these things. You know what's crazy? There are a lot of people get scared about tomorrow and what the end looks like, but here's the thing. I know the grace of God and I'm not gonna see the wrath of God because his grace is good for me. I don't have to worry about that. I, I know sin will one day be judged, but because of grace, I don't have to worry about wrath. Does it mean I don't face persecution? I don't know. Does it mean I don't face hardship? Absolutely not. The Bible's really clear in Timothy that a good soldier will embrace and go through hardship. But what it does say is this. If I understand grace, even with what the end looks like, I can live at peace with what today is like. Hello? Hello? So Paul says, may grace and peace be unto you, for Jesus gave his life for our sins, just as God our Father had planned out years ago. In order to what? Say rescue. He wants to rescue you. How many of you know you, you, you need rescued? And how many of you know someone that he's rescued a lot? All right. The plan of God was to rescue us from the evil world which we live. All glory to God forever and ever, amen. I am shocked or astonished or in wonder that you are turning away so soon from God. Listen to what Paul goes into, and we're gonna dive into these four or five verses this morning. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself. Through the loving mercy of Christ, you are following a different way that pretends to be good news. But it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who have deliberately twisted the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one that we preach to you. I say again what we have said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be accursed. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people. I love this verse right here, by the way, and I'm gonna try to preach this way. But I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but God, if pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servants. For Brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on human reasoning. I received my message with no human source and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. I wanna talk about this idea of cheap grace for a few moments. If you're taking notes, I want you to write some things down and we're gonna take a brief journey through these verses and also some other verses regarding grace this morning. And if I could say this to you, please track with me because I think in the house of God, we don't all have a clear understanding of grace. I don't even know if I fully understand it. And here's the why. Grace is the consummate rebuttal to man's pride. And in our humanness, there is this pride that wants to rise up of knowledge and intellect and understanding, and, and I get it. But when it comes to grace, your pride does not get it. My pride cannot reason through why one man would lay down his life and die so I could live. It does not make sense. And what is grace? The definition of grace, many of us know, is what? Unmerited favor, right? It's this favor that is not merited. I didn't do anything of merit to get this favor. Look at your neighbor and say, that's for you. Come on, just say it. You did nothing, and yet God poured out his favor. 
You did nothing and God gave you mercy and grace and salvation. See, here's the difference. Mercy is where you don't get what you deserve. You act out, God's merciful, you don't get what you deserve, you don't have judgment. But grace is this, I'm gonna give you favor even when you don't deserve it. You did nothing to earn it. That's what grace is. So if we're taking a journey through Galatians and the idea of grace and the subject of grace, there are two prominent things I wanna talk about in this particular passage of scripture. The first is found uh, in verse, uh, verse six. I'm shocked that you are running away and turning away from God who called you to himself. Excuse me, I'm, that's the second point. First one is in the first part of Galatians. It says this in verse three, that God gave a plan to give Jesus to us to rescue us from the evil world. First thing you need to write down this morning is Jesus is the source and rescue is the purpose. Why grace? Jesus is your source and rescue was his purpose. I don't know about you, I needed rescue. I was just reading actually this morning by chance on Fakebook, and uh, there was an article on Fakebook from the Arizona uh, Republic, and there was a diver and a swimmer from Chaparral High School, and I don't know if you saw this today, but just this last summer, he was in, uh, he was in California, he was walking along one of the beach, one of the, the cliff faces, and as he's looking down, he saw a daughter and a mom that were out in the ocean being beat up by the waves, and so he is a part of Chaparral's championship swim team. He's like, well, I just did what I was supposed to do, and I love it. He saw someone drowning, and he went and jumped off a 20-foot cliff, and he didn't, he didn't want the story. You know how the media is. It's like, give me a good story, and they just want to get you. But he jumped off the cliff, went out, saved the daughter, pulled her in, went out, saved the, the, the mom as well, and they were both in safety. Their lives were indebted to him. They were both drowning, getting beaten by the turbulent waves. We were drowning in our sin. We were drowning in our past. We were drowning in our shame. But Jesus, the source, came to rescue us, the purpose, by grace. Why grace? Because I needed it. Because the law very clearly shows me I'm not good enough. Say, I'm not good enough. Come on, say it. How many of you know that the law is difficult? There's over 600 laws in Jewish custom to live by. You don't have five of them right most of the time. Anybody eat bacon this week? You broke the law. Hello? The law is there to show me where I fail. That's why I like to speed. I got a speed limit. It just shows me where I'm breaking the law, and I like that. But when I tell the cop, but, but isn't there grace? He doesn't have that same grace for me when I get pulled over. But when it comes to the things of God, to the spiritual things of life, Jesus is the source and rescue is his purpose. You're here today not because a person invited you or not because a preacher is talking to you. You are here today and you have freedom because of grace that Jesus rescued you. Yet some of you have rescue, but you're still walking around in the fear of what you were rescued from. You don't understand grace. If you are rescued out of that, but you're still living mentally in that, you haven't walked in full rescue of grace. Because grace is the manifesto of freedom in a Christ follower's life where we walk free. I don't live to the past. I don't live to the things that define me. I walk forward to what's ahead of me. I love what Ephesians says. Many of you know the verse of Ephesians. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter two, if you wanna flip there, you wanna just read it with me, it says this in verse six. And God raised us up with Christ, seated with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might display the surpassing riches of his grace, demonstrated by his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Here's the part we all know. Verse eight, it says this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not of works yourselves. It is the gift of God. We just kind of quoted that together. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight. Then it says this in verse nine, it's not by works so none of you can boast. So say to somebody, stop boasting. Come on, just tell them, stop bragging. Well, I gave this much. I did this much. I was in church this much. Those are all the outflow of grace. And many of us want to work outside in. Grace works inside out. Works are outside. How much did I drop in? How much did I give? How many times? How many of you know when you were in Sunday school? How many of you, I'm just curious. Pastor Jerry and I were talking. How many of you ever went to Sunday school? Remember Sunday school? Okay, some of you, remember Sunday school? It's bribery. <laughs> Sunday school is bribery. If you memorize the Ten Commandments, you will get a foot long uh, a, a yardstick full of candy bars. Remember that? Anybody ever do that one? I was crazy enough to do it, and I blame the church for starting my obesity problem. That's the church's <laughs> fault. I'm like, I want a foot long. I didn't know what a foot long candy bar was. I will never forget that I memorized the Ten Commandments in Winslow, Arizona. It's because you had nothing else to do in Winslow, Arizona, just so you know. 
And I'm like, Dad, why did you pastor in Winslow? It was so I could memorize the Ten Commandments. That's the only reason. And if I memorized the Ten Commandments, one of my teachers in Sunday school, I got to go spend an afternoon riding their horses with them. And I, I don't know why, but I remember going horseback riding uh, because I memorized certain. It was bribery. And, and I, I love it. I'm grateful for it. I think we should. But, but and I'm not, please, I'm not some of you like, I love Sunday school. I did too, I promise, I did. I love flannel graph Jesus. <laughs> flannel graph. Some of you are like, what are we talking about? Just look it up. You know what I'm talking about. Anybody remember Joyce Rose? Joyce was like the best teacher this church has ever. She was awesome, man. She was incredible. When I was youth pastor, she would always teach the junior high Sunday school class. I used to go in there to learn what I was supposed to preach on Wednesday. That's why I did it. But, but some of these things, if we're not careful, we fall prey to a habit in the church where we work outside in. If I, then he. If I, then I'm good enough. If I do this, then I receive. That's a law called sowing and reaping, but the grace of God for you is not an issue of sowing and reaping. He sowed with his life. You reap the benefits of grace. That's it. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, so you can't get your works going, so stop bragging. If we're not careful, we have people in the church that may not boast boldly, but they are internally boasting because, well, I'm holy, I'm good, I'm great. Uh, stop it. That's not grace. Grace can seem almost twisted as well in this regard that why would God do this? It says in Ephesians, we just read it, that, that before the world was formed, we just read it in Galatians, that God set a plan in motion. Why would God set a plan in motion to rescue us? How many of you know you needed it, right? He knew what we would need. He knew where we would be. And I love what Ephesians says. He begins to echo and define why grace. Look what it says again. We love I'm saved by grace through faith, but we always skip over verse seven. We are seated in heavenly places, verse seven of Ephesians, in order that in the coming ages he might display the surpassing riches of his grace, demonstrated by the kindness for us all. For it is grace we have been saved. Move on. It is the gift of God in verse 8. If you're taking notes, I want to answer the question as to why grace. Why did Jesus come as the source and rescue was his purpose? If you're taking notes, first reason is this. He did it through, through grace because of this. Grace is the ultimate gift. Grace is the ultimate gift. Grace excludes all human effort. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we what? Deserved it. Say deserved it. Jesus didn't give you grace because you deserved it. You didn't deserve it, you rotten scoundrel. You didn't deserve it. None of us deserved it, but what is it? It's that free gift. It's that gift that only Jesus can give us because God called him to it and set it in motion. We didn't deserve it, but because it was his plan from the beginning of time, why? To show or demonstrate his grace through Jesus Christ. You need to understand this. Why is grace important? It's because grace is the ultimate gift. Grace takes the authority off of me earning salvation and puts it only one place, Jesus Christ. I cannot do it. I have to receive the free gift of God. Pastor, why are you talking to a church about this? Because many of us walk around with cheap grace or twisted grace because we don't look at it the way God called us to. Jesus is not one that gives and takes back, gives and takes back when it comes to grace. He gives you his grace freely when you receive it and you walk in the freedom of what grace calls you to. And I love what it says here. It says that it is the free gift. Say it's a free gift. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute. I don't understand how every day afforded me is by the grace of God. I don't understand that every breath afforded me is by the grace of God. I don't understand how my life, I was doing this. Greg Huntington, are you in the room? Okay, good. So I'm hunting with Greg a couple weeks ago, and, and we're praying over a meal, and, and uh, Greg took prayer one day and one night, and he started praying. We were kind of interchanging prayers, and he's praying, and I, I was so ticked off. Let him know, too. We're praying, and he's like, Lord, thank you for this day. It's a great day. And, uh, and then he began to, th this, to say this, Lord, thank you for the disappointments today. It's like, Translation, thank you we didn't see any elk today. 
And, and I got to thinking, I'm like, man, that's kind of crazy. Talking to David a couple weeks ago at lunch, just about some of the hardship. And you were talking about just the grace of God, how even the hardships, his grace is present. And it's been over, over a series of a couple weeks, I feel like, and then I'm studying this, and I'm like, this is ticking me off. Like, it's grace. Even through hardship, I still have grace. Even through trial, I still have grace. Even through medical reports, there's still grace. Even through challenges with my family, there's still grace. And it's a gift that is given to me and you. And it is the rebuttal to my human effort where I think, well, God will love me more because of what I do. It doesn't matter. He loves you because of what his son did. And you can worship awesome, and you can give great, and you can sit four weeks out of four weeks a month, and you can sit one week out of four a month. That does not change his grace. But I will tell you this, that when you receive his grace, your actions begin to change to line up with his grace. Because it's like, I just want, God, thank you. I'm humble. I can't believe. And some of those things that you maybe do or don't do, they shift because you have a revelation of that gift. I don't do certain things because I have to. I do it because I'm just resigned to the place of, Lord, thank you. Man, I don't deserve it. I shouldn't be here right now. Most of us shouldn't be here right now, and yet we are because of the grace of God. Why grace? It's because grace is the ultimate gift. It is the ultimate gift where Jesus paid your debt that you owed. It's like him walking into your spiritual mortgage deficit and saying, I'm gonna pay for all of that in one place, paid in full, and I'm gonna put on it, give him the title back to his life, and the title for your life is you now have been a new creation. You are a new believer. You are a new person in Christ, and when Jesus comes to you and you receive his grace, he's signed off on your debt. He passed that away and he gave you a clearance card and said, you know what, it's free. It's free. It's the ultimate gift. Why grace? Secondly, it says in Ephesians, not only do we have grace that is the ultimate gift that excludes all human effort, and I know you're gonna hear this over and over today, but there's somebody in this room that needs to be set free. You've been trying to do it on your own effort. Stop it. Stop it. The second characteristic that grace is imperative for as the body of Christ is this. It's found in also Ephesians and Galatians that we read. It's this. Grace is there because it's a display of the riches of God. Look what Ephesians says. It says that in the ages to come, there was a plan of God in order to give Jesus his son to display his surpassing riches of his grace. What does that mean when I receive grace? It means that you're invaluable. It means that that God gave the best of who he is by giving you his son, even in the midst of the worst of who you are. Surpassing riches. It's not that God is flaunting his wealth. It's not that God's walking around and just like making it rain. It's not like that's how God, but what God is saying when you receive grace, he's saying to you, there is no amount of money that's as precious as you are. That's why my son covered you with the blood of Christ. And it's this surpassing riches. Think about it for a moment. The firstborn of God, if you will, his only begotten son is who laid down his life for you. I have one son and one daughter. There were seasons I maybe thought I'd give both of them for certain things. You know what I'm talking about? But you, I I don't know that I'd ever give my son or my daughter for that matter. (laughs) Let me clarify, better cover that one or it's gonna be a long afternoon in the Peters Ranch. (laughs) But in context, firstborn, my son's my firstborn. There isn't any of you I like enough to give my firstborn. There's no amount of money you could, (laughs) let me just check, I need to be sure I'm not lying. There's no amount of money, I'm serious. There's no amount of money I'm gonna give to to merit some favor towards you. Sorry, I may like you, not that much. And yet Father said, you know what? I'm gonna model with my surpassing riches. I'm gonna give the most precious thing to me because I value them. That's what makes Jesus and grace so different than any other religion. It's a display of his surpassing riches. And then third thing, why grace is this. It's not just a display of riches. It's a demonstration of his love. Why grace? It demonstrated his love. Romans tells us this. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we are still sinners. Say, I'm a sinner. 
saved by grace. When you were still a sinner, Jesus died for you. When you were lost in your sin, Jesus died. Why? Because he had to know. Because it's a demonstration. So the world can see. So history will tell. So the church can celebrate. So we can partake of communion realizing I am a result of the demonstration of the love of Jesus. That's why we can take communion today. Is because he demonstrated his love towards us. Do you understand that this morning? That's the grace of God, a demonstration of his love for you. It's not that he had to. It's because he desired to. Jesus is the source, and rescue is your purpose, his purpose. Grace under fire. I want to close with this, and I, I have to fly. Verses 6 through 9 say this. Paul addresses to the church in the region of Galatia, and he says, I'm shocked that you're turning away so soon from God. In other words, I don't understand how quickly you receive grace and how quickly you're trashing it. Anybody ever felt that before? I'm shocked, and, and Paul kind of gives an admonition to the church, if you will. He, he gives a, a careful rebuke in this moment, and he says this. He goes, I don't understand why you've turned away from God so soon, who has called you to himself through loving mercy in Christ. You are following a different way, listen to this, that pretends. This is why I feel like grace is under fire in the American church today, is we have bought pretensions and we haven't laid hold of truth. There is a gospel that pretends to be good news, but in the end, it leaves you with an appetite, and in the end, it leaves you with a bad taste. When you truly inherit and receive the good news of Christ, you are fulfilled, you're content, you're satisfied. And then it says this, you are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth. If you're taking notes, there are a couple factors of why I believe grace is under fire and some of what Paul was speaking to. I need you to track with me, and I, uh, I'll be careful to get through this as quickly as I can. This is when I probably should do a part two, but here we go. You ever bought into this lie where you, you, you turn away too soon? You love God, and then life gets you, or you get under dogma or teaching or certain things, and it begins to twist what you believe. If you're taking notes, I want you to consider this for a moment because I think this is important, that in the church, there is this temptation to have a great exchange, to have this trade-off. I'm shocked that you have traded away what God did for what you want. Who was Paul speaking to? If you're taking notes and understand, he's talking to what we call the Judaizers. He's talking to the religious of that day. He's talking to the Judaizers who are coming to a Gentile place and saying, you know what, if you want salvation, you better do this, do this, do this, do this, or more importantly, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. How many were raised in a church like that? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's like some of us were raised in a church like, don't play cards, don't go to movies, don't wear short shorts, don't wear makeup, don't do, anybody know what I'm talking about? And it's crazy because we were told what not to do, but we weren't always communicated how to do the right things. And, and I want to set this seed right now because I feel like at the end of service, there's some of you in this room, God wants to set you free. Not to do what you want, but to do what he wants. And it's interesting when you consider this for a moment, Paul is speaking to a New Testament church that had been saved by grace through faith, not of themselves, but there was such a doctrine of Judaism and legalism that began to creep in to the church. Because when we allow our pride to get in the way, we will always twist truth to fit our means. And here's who he's speaking to. He's speaking to a Jewish Mosaic law. I don't want to get too crazy here, but he's speaking to the laws of this is your Sabbath, this is what you eat, this is how you carry yourself, and the Jewish custom was creeping into a culture that was saved by grace, and it isn't that those things were wrong. The problem was those things became the merit of their salvation. I don't believe those things are wrong in and of themselves. If you celebrate a Sabbath on a Friday night or a Saturday or a Sunday, those things aren't wrong. But when it becomes wrong is when that becomes the merit of your salvation and you look down on or against someone who isn't doing it the way you think they should. 
And so Paul's addressing a church that's living free to Christ. They're not bought by themselves. They're bought by the blood of Christ. And Paul says these words, how quickly you turned away. Why? Because when dogma comes in and doctrine comes in, it begins to twist the truth many times. And here is the great exchange that began to happen in this particular setting. You've turned away. I'm shocked. I can't believe it. Well, what was happening? First thing was this, is they were being turned away with this exchange. Works is what gets you salvation. The great exchange we're seeing today, and if you don't believe me, then I dare you to go and read some things and look at some church dogmas right now. One of the great exchanges that's happening in the church today is where we're saved by grace, but we merit our faith on our works. Well, pastor, doesn't the Bible say faith without works is dead? Absolutely, but you're dead if you don't have grace. I'm saved by grace through faith and that not of myself. I'm not trying to twist things. I need you to hear me for a moment. If we're not careful, we begin to replace grace. I'm saved by grace through faith with I'm saved by works through what I do as faithful. That's not how we're saved. And there's an exchange happening in the church culture today. And you say, well, pastor, it's not. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I felt like if I didn't do certain things, I was gonna be in trouble. I'll be honest, some of my upbringing, I was more scared to not go to hell than I was to just desire heaven. I've learned in my older life that sometimes I just blame that to excuse my behaviors, which is another day, but here's the reality. Works has now been a great exchange for many. Well, I'm good enough. I've heard this. If I had a dollar for every time, well, I'm a good person, sorry. Just because you do good things doesn't mean you're a good person. But if you're a good person under grace, you will do good things. That has to happen. But works is being exchanged. Some of you in this room know what it's like to be bound by a works gospel, if you're good enough, if you do enough. And I wanna tell you, what Paul was speaking to was directly against the opposition of legalism, and he was bringing freedom to the early church. Don't be bound up by what Jesus came to set you free from. Pastor, works are important. Yes, they are. We're gonna talk about it later in Galatians, bearing fruit. We're gonna talk about it later, doing the things that God's called you to. But you can't bear fruit with legalism because then it won't be something somebody wants to taste. Works is, is this idea of we get what we give. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I get what I didn't deserve, unmerited favor. And it's this works that is an exchange we need to come. It's the works that I've taken on, I need to submit to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Second thing about grace is this. It's this exchange that's happening. Well, Jesus said, I'm gonna come and give you unmerited favor, and you didn't do anything. But there's this other exchange many of us do. Not only works, but how much our effort is. I'm, gonna, I'm just trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to live holy. I'm trying to do the right thing. Come on, how many of you ever done that? I'm just trying, I'm trying to discipline my eyes. I'm trying to forgive. I'm trying, I'm trying. Anybody ever said that? Good, five of you. I've done that. And we have replaced his all-sufficient work on the cross with my efforts. Well, if I just try enough, if I just do enough, not just works, but just the passion behind it, what would happen if you started resting in the all-sufficient power of the cross? And your efforts would be in what Jesus has done for you instead of what you could do for yourself. And then we talk briefly about this exchange. It's called the law. The law reveals the standard to which we are sinners, but it's only grace that can erase the standard of judgment you deserved. I want to say that again. It's the law that reveals the standard by which we are sinners. It shows me where I fall short, but it's only the grace of God that can erase the standard of judgment that I deserve. Don't exchange Fulfilling the law for walking in freedom of grace. So we have this great exchange, and then we have, as I close, we have this great deception. It continues on where Paul says, I'm shocked that you're doing these things. You're turning away from God. You're turning to old doctrine. You're turning to old patterns. You're, you're turning to all these things. You're bragging about how you rank. And then he says these words. He goes, he goes that you are now taking on a gospel that is pretentious of good news, but it is not good news. You are being fooled by those who deliberately deceive or twist the truth. We not only have the great exchange, but we've got a great deception that's creeping in. I want you to think about a couple deceptions that happen when you start getting works, law, and effort before grace. Deception number one, if I do enough, I'm okay. 
confession for a moment. How many of you have ever felt like you're not doing enough for God? Friday night, went down to Phoenix, hung out with my son. I told you a week or two ago, I said, I mean, I just kind of miss my son. So Rachel and I took our day off Friday, went and hung out with my son and went to Payway. Um, that's going to be a food in heaven, by the way, I believe. Spicy chicken will be there. Went to Payway, hung out, had some. Hey, you know what's crazy, though? Is he doesn't have to do anything. He's my boy. He doesn't have to be good, do good. It's weird. When you get on this side of parenting, it's weird. I'm now a cheerleader, not the one telling him how he should live his life. That's a weird thing. But deception, one that creeps in when we start mixing grace with, with law and works, and we begin to think these thoughts like, well, you know what? It's, it's all right. If I do enough, I'm going to be okay. It's not truth. Truth is his work on the cross is more than enough. And because of that, we now call out Abba Father. Because of that, we now are sons and daughters. It does not change your inheritance. When you respond to his grace, you are his son. You are his daughter. You're not a stepson. You're not something else. You are his. And there's nothing you could do to change that. Sitting with my son, there's certain things we're saying as we were sitting in a, a mall eating Wetzel's pretzels, and we sent her a lot of things around food in my house, and, and we're eating Wetzel's pretzels, and, and my son was saying some things, and, and in my natural, I'm like, oof, like, I, I don't know, I'd say that, and I say a lot of things. But it doesn't matter, he's still my son. Second deception is this. This deception that, well, if it's grace and, and it's okay and I got the, the, the pretension of good news, here's the grace. Well, whatever feels good, do it. Cheap grace. Make no mistake in this room, godliness will flow out of grace, but flesh will beget flesh. It's not whatever feels good. It's taking on the goodness of the one whose name is Jesus and letting him work inside out that then good behaviors happen and then godliness is different. Remember, we are saved by grace through faith. What changes my works is that I've let him come in and change my heart. Third deception is this. Many in the church today have bought into this deception. We blame the law to excuse our behaviors today. Let me translate. Stop blaming the church you were raised in to excuse your behaviors today. Well, if I wasn't raised, they did this. and So you know what? I'm just going to be free. I'm free to do what I want to do. I don't know the rest of the song. But no, that's not the truth. Stop blaming the no makeup, no mascara, no accessories, no pants in church. That's not what I meant. It's not what I meant. My youth pastor is reminding me we're not that kind of church. We're not that kind of church. You know, most of the time my funny things are stupid. I don't mean them. Like, please wear pants. But remember, some of you were raised in a church where women did not wear, they wore dresses. You know what I'm talking about? You're like, I just, I hate that. So you know what? I'm just going to stop. That's legalism. And if we don't set ourselves free from that and let the blood of Jesus set us free from our thinking, then we become very critical of everything. And you know why there's some people want nothing to do with the grace we walk in? because we're living in the bondage of what we were raised in. Well, did you know they had a hat on? They, they had a hat. They had a hat on the platform. Some of you, I just stepped on your toes. <laughs> it's because we want to excuse our opinion. It's almost like we justify our opinions because of the way we were raised. It's a lie. Am I saying we don't have modesty? Am I saying we don't consider others? It's not what I'm saying. There are biblical principles we still have to live out, but be careful that your excuses do not change or that you don't excuse behaviors because of what you were raised in. Fourth deception, real quick, I got one more and then we're done. Worship team, can you come get ready? Fourth deception is this. When I fail in the law, I fall out of grace. There's some of you in this room right now that you have bought the deception that when you fail in the law, you're no longer under grace. That's not true. You're under grace. You can fail in the law. You're under grace. 
You can blow it when you leave this room and break the law and you're still under grace. So be careful that you don't buy that. Does it mean you still live there? No, you've gotta let Christ work in you. And you know what's really interesting, the fifth deception, is that almost every other, if not every other world religion, religious sect, lives under a dogma of works, not under grace. And we become deceived to where I think I look more like Islam, Hinduism, other sects of Christendom. That's why Martin Luther pounded the theses on the door and said, that's not what saves me. Even to a, a massive segment of Christendom that is bought in works, that's not the gospel of Jesus. And Galatians is a book that's a manifesto of freedom. Look what it says here. It says that you are a part of a gospel that pretends to be good news. A couple months ago, I was craving meat. Hang with me. And I remember seeing some commercials. I don't know what I was watching, but I saw these commercials, and they look awesome. By the way, have you ever noticed how certain commercials you, you look at it's like, I gotta go there, and then it's a lie. It's a lie. Everything they put on the commercial is not what you actually eat. And so here was the particular restaurant. I was craving some meat, and, and uh, I think it was with Drew and Andy. We've been Havelina hunting over in the Prescott area. And I'm like, let's do this for lunch. Let's go to Golden Corral. I've been seeing, and if you like Golden Corral, I'm sorry. And, and we saw all these commercials, and all I could think of was, I am going to have all-you-can-eat prime rib. I just, all-you-can-eat prime rib. Well, little did I know, because they don't tell you in the commercial the only days they serve prime rib. So they sucker you, and then you go there, and literally, I'm not exaggerating, I'm like, I'm gonna have all this prime rib, and all this meat, and all this chicken, it's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be heaven. It's like, for me, it's gonna be amazing. And I, I literally go into Golden Corral, I see the signs on the door, I see the signs in the windows in Prescott, I was so excited, and then I go, and I don't go check the, I should have checked the buffet. But I'm like, oh, it's gotta be there. They said it's gonna be there, it's gonna be there. And here's what happened. I literally, I go to the cash register, I say, you know, I just want your buffet, all you can eat buffet, blah, blah, blah. And they ring it up and I'm like, hold on, I need to get a second on my house to pay for this thing. Like, it was like 18, 20 bucks. I'm like, this is ridiculous. How many of you know the more money you pay at a buffet, the more you eat, because you're gonna get your money's worth. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I paid, I'm like, well, it's all right. The prime rib's gonna be worth it. And I go and I start going down three massive buffets. And I'm like, that's old, that's nasty. KFC has better chicken than that. Mashed potato, that's nasty. And I go down and I literally, I'm like getting a plate with sideboards and I go to, I, I was ready to pile it on. I'm like, get it. It felt like pretending. Pastor, what's your point? Literally, I'm pretending I'm gonna have a meat feast and I go to Golden Corral. What was I thinking? If I want a meat feast, I'm going to Fogo de Chao in Phoenix or Ruth Chris Steakhouse or something else. But here's what many of us have done with the gospel of grace. It's like we have this perspective and this idea and we've bought into this thing that's pretentious and it doesn't meet you where you need to be met. I left Golden Corral and I literally wanted to go to Texas Roadhouse and, pay, and get another steak. It's like, but they weren't open. That's why I didn't go there. What's my point? There are many in the church that we have exchanged something that sustains us for something that looks good. Well, if it feels good, do it. That may look good for a season. It's destructive in the end. Works may look good for a season, but it's gonna leave you miserable because you're empty and you realize you can be great and still fall short of God's holiness. Don't exchange pretend good news for sustaining good news. Tell, come up here, please. I love it when you have staff that do what you tell them to do. I did not ask Pastor Jerry because he wouldn't have done this. That's just telling you. So, there. When's the last time you had handcuffs on? Okay. Just turn 
these guys. You know one of the greatest pictures, here's what we're gonna do. Tell, uh, it's worship in church right now, all right? It's worship. I, I want you to worship Jesus. You know what, it's time to give. Go, go ahead and, and I need you. Tell, we're gonna serve the body. I want you to serve. Can you please help me? See, it's a picture of many in the church today where we've been handcuffed with deception, legalism, law, and, and we love Jesus, we're here, but pastor says, hey, let's lift our hands. You're like, I was on pornography site last night. I, I, my wife and I fought the whole way to church. How many of you have ever done that? Just confess, it's all right. That's why my wife and I drive two vehicles. Because <laughs> she won't quit fighting with me on Sunday mornings. Before we were married, she was fight. I had to fight her to stay off of me. You know, it's like, I got to go be holy. And now it's like we just, anyway, I digress. I'm sorry. Shoot, I got to wrap up. There's so many in the church right now. Love God, call of God, save. They're going to heaven. This is awesome. I love beating this guy. And here's what happens. We're going to worship God. And you can't even worship because you're bound. We're going to give to a legacy offering. I can't give because I'm bound. It's not going to be enough. And I'm not being holy. And I'm not. We're bound. And God's coming right now through Jesus to bring freedom to you. And it's called grace. It unlocks freedom in your life. I don't have a key. You got a key, JC? Okay, good. So here's, James is an ugly Jesus, but come on up here and be Jesus for a second. And here's what God wants to do. And some of you in this room right now, listen. For the first time, you have a picture of sin. Sin has bound you. The good news of grace is here for you. That's first and foremost. We just took communion because the blood of Jesus was shed to set you free. But there are many in the church, if we were honest with ourselves, we're just like this. We're just, I don't know what's happened in many in the church. I don't know what's happened, but I can go through seasons in my life where there was an unlocking to the bondage, where there was an unlocking to the work. It didn't give me liberty to do sin. It gave me liberty to serve, to give, to worship, to do things God called me to do because I'm under grace. You know what? You weren't very good this week to your wife. That's what happens. You weren't very good to the church. That, this is what we do. You weren't perfect enough, and we begin to encumber ourselves. And we need Jesus, James. Go ahead and set him free, because this is ugly. Set him free. We need Jesus to unlock some things. I thought James knew what he was doing, but, but uh, it's all right. Oh, I put him on backwards, see? How many of you have ever been in handcuffs? You know what's gonna happen? Second service, I'm gonna have the whole service. It happened a couple weeks ago, and I'm like, how many have been in jail? Like 20% of you. Second service, 80%. I've been in jail. I loved it, man. You may have not been in physical jail, physical handcuffs, but you're bound. Boldly, without hesitation, if you don't know Jesus today and you've been held captive, to your sin, you've been bound to the past. His grace is sufficient for you. You want to give your life to Jesus. We're going to celebrate with you. We're going to pray with you without hesitation, boldly say, I, I want to be loosed of my past, loosed of the sin. I want to walk free in Christ. If you're here, would you raise your hand without hesitation? Just raise your hand. Come on. Boldly. Thanks, bro. Thanks, bro. Anybody else? I want to give my life to Jesus. Anybody else? Just want to surrender my life to Christ. Anybody else? Come on. Come on. Can you guys stand real quick? Come on. Oh, you misunderstood it. Man, that's my problem. Anybody? Did I miss anybody? Pastor Jerry's pointing. I don't know where he's pointing, though. If you raise your hand, would you stand? If I missed you, just raise your hand. If you raise your hand, just stand. We're going to celebrate with you. There are going to be others join you right now. You want to give your life to Christ at home as well. Second question, without hesitation, you say, Pastor, I've, I've kind of been bound up to some things and I've misunderstood some things. Maybe it's your legalistic upbringing. Maybe it's your past, and you want to walk free in Christ. You want a lesson of freedom. You want a manifesto of freedom. Maybe it's the things you're battling in your mind. Whatever it is, you've been bent up and hung up in the handcuffs. If that's you, stand to your feet right now. We're going to pray. God's going to bring freedom to your life. Come on, just stand. 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 Come on. There's freedom in Christ. Stand. A bunch of you.
couple more seconds. Just stand, come on. If you're next to one of these that are standing, I want you to take three minutes. I want you to get out of your seat. And I want you to go next to them. And I want you to pray. Come on, just stand right where you are. Go, you see them standing. Come on, step out of your seat. And I want to pray right now. Come on, let's do it. If you're at home and you're saying, I need freedom right now, only in the grace of Christ, we're going to pray for you. Come on, let's do it right now. I don't want to forget anyone. I don't want to leave anyone. Let's be the body right now. Jesus, thank you for your grace.